Hi everyone. Today we'll start with a new chapter of complex numbers. So before I start with anything, um, I, I, unlike the name complex numbers, the chapter isn't that complex. Okay. Yes, uh, there is a little bit of theoretical information, conceptual information that, that will definitely be new for you. And that might even, you know, for the first time, because it's the first time you're learning this, you might, you know, it might take a really long time for you to wrap your head around it as well. But I assure you that by no means is this chapter complex. Okay, right? Obviously, there is a little bit of new information. And especially when we deal with complex numbers, we're technically dealing with a term called imaginary numbers, right? And, you know, imaginary numbers, when you think of it, you're like, yeah, it's imaginary. So if it's imaginary, it's not real. And if it's not real, then what is the use of it? Right. And, you know, before, you know, I start with anything, um, you know, I would just like to talk about just complex numbers in general. So, you know, complex numbers, obviously, you know, as students, we always want to ask, look, what is the real life application of this? You know, we talk about addition, subtraction when we were little, multiplication, division, you know, we come to equations, we come to and we see how how equations can come real handy in, uh, in, you know, real life applications, especially ratio proportions. Then we come to quadratic equations, stuff like that. And now we come to complex numbers, right? You know, first thing that comes to complex numbers will probably be imaginary numbers, right? Because we're dealing with a term called imaginary numbers. And I'll get it, get, get it deeper into that as, you know, we move forward in this video. But the first thing that, you know, comes to comes in mind from complex numbers is imaginary numbers, right? It's not real, right? It's not real, right? So then if it's not real, then why are we learning it, right? I mean, one big application I can think of right, you know, think of right off the bat is probably the use in electrical, uh, elect, uh, I would say not in electrical, but in, electro, in, like, in electrical engineering, especially. So use in electrical engineering. So this is, you know, kind of as you move forward into, you know, college studies, university studies is where you really see the application of it, right? Uh, it's used in AC circuits, you know, just to give you guys a little bit of brief, you know, basically circuits, if you have studied electricity in physics yet, of two types, you know, DC direct current and AC alternating current. So in DC, you have current flowing in one direction. In alternating current, you have current flowing in both opposite opposite direction. They're changing, you know, with a different frequency every every time. You know, they're lasting, you know, in one direction for a certain amount of seconds, and they're changing its direction, you know, you know maybe you know, there are a few milliseconds or microseconds or even a few hundred seconds, you know, so stuff like that. So this is the major major application of complex numbers, right? I don't want to get too deeper into that because it, it, it does get really, really complicated. And definitely, you know, you do not need to know about it any, you know, right now at this stage. So I just want to, you know, tell you guys about what complex numbers is. And just so you know, you guys don't feel like, okay, we're just learning something for the sake of learning because it's in the course. You know, I just wanted to give you guys a li little bit of feel. I'm trying to give you guys a little bit of feel, although I don't think, you know, I'm too great at it, but let's see how it goes. All right. So, now let's talk about complex numbers, right? If it's if it's imaginary, right? If it's not real, what is why why do we need them, right? Obviously, there must have been some some need of them. That's why we even started learning about it. That's why mathematicians started deriving things related to complex numbers, right? So let, let's let me change the color, right? Let's let's make it lime, right? So why do we even need complex numbers, right? See, when we usually solve a quadratic equation, right, we're given two roots, and those two roots are basically where the quadratic equation, you know, intersects with the x-axis or when y equals zero, right? But we reach a point where sometimes uh, the real numbers that we have do not satisfy every single condition, right? And when this condition isn't satisfied, mathematicians thought of something called imaginary numbers, right? So let me give you an example, right? A very simple, basic example. Let's take another color, orange. We have, let me write this example, right? We have x squared plus 1 is equal to 0, right? 
Now, if we were to solve this, what do we get? We get x squared is equal to minus 1. And x squared is equal to plus minus negative 1. Now, you all know that square root of negative 1 does not give any real number, right? It does not exist. And we can verify that, right? If we draw a graph, right? If we were to draw a graph, let's see like this, right? If we were to draw a graph with the x and y axis like this, and we have the parabola, parabola uh, x squared plus 1. So we got something like this, right? Something like this. And where this is, you know, where this is 0, 1. And you can see that this parabola doesn't, does not uh, intersect the x-axis at all, right? So therefore, there are no real roots. But, you know, we want to satisfy this condition. And the only way with which we can satisfy this condition is by the use of complex numbers, right? And there's special there's a special way that we denote this value, right? Square root of negative 1, I'm sure you guys have learned in class already, is always denoted by something called I or iota, right? It stands for iota, right? And you're going to see this multiple times, right? So square root of negative 1 is always denoted as iota, right? I'll just rewrite it here. I is equal to square root of minus 1. Right. So this is the basis of complex numbers, right? This is where we have imaginary numbers. This is where imaginary numbers come from, right? All right. So now, now the real question is, does this, does this iota or does this square root of negative one, does this satisfy the remaining condition, right? Previously, I mentioned that, you know, there are, there are a range of numbers which with which real numbers do not satisfy, right? Suppose we have this huge, huge pool, right? Suppose we have a huge pool, right? We have a huge pool. And maybe uh, real numbers is this much, right? This is real numbers, right? But the remaining, right? The remaining an orange is the pool that is not satisfied by real numbers, right? So in that pool, we just identified imaginary number iota, right? Now the question is, does this iota satisfy all the remaining or numbers that are not satisfied by the real numbers? That is the real question. And, you know, we can, we can try this out, right? Suppose we have another equation. Let's say uh, we have another equation which says x squared plus 4 is equal to 0, right? Another example. So if we subtract 4 on both sides, what do we have? We have x squared is equal to minus 4, right? And then we have x is equal to plus or minus square root of minus 4. Well, now how do we, you know, if we have to, you know, express this in a similar manner, how do we do it, right? What I just did from here is I can write basically x is equal to, sorry, I meant to write x, right? So x is equal to plus or minus iota. Right? Now, if I have to do something like that, how do I do it here? Right? Well, I know 4 is a perfect square, and square root of 4 is technically 2. Right? So if I, I can rewrite this just so it's easy on the eye, I can say square root of 4 times square root of minus 1. Right? I can break it apart like this. Well, I know square root of 4 is 2, so then what I can do is plus or minus 2 times square root of 1. And then if we simplify it a bit more, what do we have? We have square root of uh, sorry, 2 plus minus, plus minus 2i. So as you can see, even this condition is satisfied by, you know, iota, right? So iota seems to satisfy this, you know, condition of um, this, this empty condition, this orange region, right? So you can see that complex numbers or imaginary numbers are, are essentially helping. They're helping, you know, fill that void which, which real numbers wasn't able to fill, right? So this is the main this is the main cause or this is the root cause of why mathematicians decided to you know use something called imaginary numbers right imaginary the name is really deceptive especially if you're hearing this for the first time that's why I'm trying to give you a really good intuitive feel for the for the need and the use of imaginary numbers right now 
at this point, you know, if I'm talking about IOTA so much, you must, you must be thinking, right? IOTA has some importance, right? There's no, there's no, it's not, it's not, you know, for some random reason why I'm discussing IOTA so much, right? And that is true. IOTA is, you know, one of the main, it's, it's the reason why complex numbers exist, right? This is the reason why we, we you know, we, we denote saying we have complex numbers because it has IOTA I to it, right? So let me, let me come to a new, new point now, right? Let's, let's change the color. Uh, let's take peach, right? So we can talk about now. Let's talk about powers of imaginary numbers, right? Right. Obviously, and we use iota simply because, right? Iota is used because we we don't want to express every time square root of negative one, right? What are we gonna write? Square root of negative one here, and then we're gonna write what are we gonna write here? Pl uh, plus minus two times square root of negative one. So that it's just really you know. Seems really irritating to write square root of negative one. So we just replace it with the I, right? I mean, technically, if you just write square root of negative one, it's not wrong. But now the convention, right? The mathematical convention is to write iota everywhere. Okay, so back to powers of imaginary numbers. We have powers of imaginary numbers, right? So we know I, we have I to the power of zero, right? Obviously, anything I to the power of zero, anything to the power of zero, whether it's imaginary numbers or real numbers, is right? Then we have normal i, right? Which is actually te technically i raised to the power 1. And that that we previously, you know, stated was square root of negative 1. Now, if we have i squared, what is that? Now, a lot of you will be tempted to say square, it's actually 1 because square root of negative 1, well, that's like square root of negative 1 whole squared. It's technically 1 because minus minus will cancel and you'll have a plus but no, so i squared is actually just minus one. Now think about it this way, right? This again, kind of confusing, right? If you're if you're seeing this for the first time, kind of confusing. I think about it this time. We have square root of two squared is always equal to two. Square root of uh, ten by three whole squared is equal to ten by three, right? Let me just rewrite this in a cleaner way. Ten by three whole squared. This is equal to 10 by 3. So basically, square root of x squared is equal to x, right? So similarly, following the same principle, square root of negative 1 whole squared, right? Whether I put the power before or after, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter because this square root is technically the half power, and then we're squaring it, so it cancels out every time. So we're actually left with a minus 1. Right? This is why i squared is minus 1. Do not write i squared is equal to one, right? That that can be really confusing, and it can you know it's it's it can be you know you might be questioning why, right? Minus the negative signs should cancel, but they don't, right? Okay, so now we have i cube. And i cube. Now think about it. I cube is what it's i squared times i. Well, we know i squared is basically minus one, so we two minus one times i, and actually gives us minus i. So i cube is minus i. I hope you understand, right? I have broke this into i squared times i. Then I did, I know i squared is minus one, right? I just, I, I explained how we get i squared as minus one. And then we have just i, and then we multiply by minus one times i, which is minus i, right? Now, let's go over to i to the power of four. So i to the power of four can be written as i squared times i squared, right? i squared times i squared. Well, we know i squared is minus 1, and we know i squared is minus 1. So now, now we can say minus 1 times minus 1. Well, the negative is negative, cancel out, become a positive, and 1 times 1 is obviously 1. So i to the power 4 is 1, right? That is the logic. Now let's look at i to the power 5, right? i to the power 5 can be written as i to the power 4 times i, right? Well, you know, i to the power 4 is 1, and i is just i, right? i is technically the square root of minus 1, but we denote it as i always, right? So I'll just write i here as well, right? And then we know that this is 1, so 1 times i is i, 
right? Simple, no, nothing, nothing too crazy. I'm just using my normal exponent rules, breaking it apart and uh, simplifying it, right? Let's look at out of the power six. Out of the power six is nothing but i to the power four times i squared, right? I to the power four is one, i to the power i to the power two is minus one. So one times minus one is minus one. Now you know, for those of you who are seeing this for the first time, let me you know let me bring this to your notice, right? If you see this one i minus one minus i one i minus one, you see a pattern, right? You see i. You see this and this as a pattern. You see this and this as a pattern. Let me, let me change the colors, right? Let me put in new colors. So actually, yeah, you know, it actually comes, it actually pops out. So this, and this, and then this, and this, and this and well obviously i didn't write the next part but you can see that there's some pattern that's being followed right so every every in at an every interval of four the power the numbers are repeating right you can see that right look at let's let me change the color first uh let's take orange right see out of the power zero one two three four it's back to one right out of the power one is i one, two, three, four. I to the power five is I. I squared is minus one. One, two, three, four. Back to minus one. So technically, you know, now, now, if you have to generalize this, what would we, what do we get? So if we say I to the power four n is actually equal to one, where n is basically positive integers, right? N belongs to z plus, right? Let's if I have to, you know, just tell what n is, right? If n is positive integers, basically every fourth multiple, every every fourth uh, n value from n starting to zero, right? From n, if n starts from zero, right? So if we have, okay, let me read this in a more acceptable manner. So if we have i to the power zero, i to the power four, i to the power eight, right? dot 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 out of the power 4n right so basically any 4n term right will have it will be equal to one right now let's look at the next one next one is 4n plus one right think about it out of the power one out of the power five then it'll be out of the power nine because every every fourth every fourth time you know four powers later basically we're getting the same number. So we can write this as i to the power 4n plus 1, right? And this is always i, right? Let's go to the next one, i squared. So if you have i squared, we have i to the power 6, then we have i to the power 10. And then if we go on, we get 4n plus 2 is equal to minus 1, right? And then we have i cubed. So i cube here. Obviously, I haven't written i to the power seven, but you get the you get the gist of it, right? Then we have i to the power eleven, all the way up to i to the power four n plus three is equal to minus i. So what we have done is we have generalized different powers of i based on the output, right? So the four possible outputs are one, i, minus one, and minus i, right? So now let's look at the application of this and, you know, let's see how, you know, this can be applied in a question. All right. So let's look at, let's look at an example question now. All right. Let's look at this example. So we have the value of this expression, so whole square is what, right? So now one common way that, you know, we can simplify this is by obviously, you know, uh, writing this twice and then using the FOIL method and evaluating whatever is inside. Right. But no, let's not do that. Let's use what we have learned up here about these different values, potential values, right? And then let's try simplifying it that way, right? So let's look at i raised to the power 23 first. So i raised to the power 23, can, how can we simplify this, right? Now, before we start simplifying, let me tell you something, right? The key in this question is always to get multiples of four in the exponent, because what that does is it allows us to simplify it just to one, 
right? And one is a lot more simpler to work with than I minus one or minus I for that matter, right? So how can we simplify this with I raised to the power four plus something something, right? And the way we can do that is by finding the closest and the lowest, you know, closest, sorry, not the lowest, I would say, closest and highest multiple of 20, you know, that that can that we can get of four, right? So in this case, 20 is probably the closest multiple, right? Which is lower than 23, obviously. So if we take, you know, uh, I would say if we take 20, right? So that how can we rewrite that as? We can write this as i raised to the power 20 plus three, right? And then I can write this as i raised to the power 20 times i raised to the power three. And then we know i raised to the power 20 can also be written as i raised to the power four times raised to the power four, sorry, i raised to the power four, which and which is raised to the power five times i cube. And we know i raised to the power four is one. And if we were anything raised to power, uh, any, any uh, one raised to the power, any number is just one. And so we're just left with i cube. And i cube is minus i right here, right? Any multiple of four n plus three is minus i. So this is actually minus i. Right now, let's look at you know one upon i raised to the power thirty seven. So, if we take at if we take a look at one raised to the power i whole thirty seven, well, what do we have? We can write this as one upon i to the power thirty seven, right? And then how? And then if we have to simplify this, how will we simplify it? So again, let's try to get multiple of four. So if we do that, we can have i raised to the power thirty six times i, right? And then we have i raised to the power 4 raised to the power 9 times i. So we have, this is 1, i raised to the power 4, one, 4 is 1, and 1 raised to the power 9 is just 1. So we're left with 1 raised to the power i. So in the end, what we have is a simplified ver version of whatever inside the parentheses that we have is minus i plus, right, plus, one plus i, right? And we can square this entire thing, right? Like this. Now, how can we simplify this a bit more, right? What we can do is let's take a common denominator, common denominator of i, right? So if we take that, what do we have? We have i minus i times i plus one upon i, and it's whole squared, right? So what is minus i times i, right? Now think about it. It's not, it's not, uh, well, technically, okay, let's let's forget. It's not exactly what you think it is. You know, let, let me say that, right? So we know i times i is minus one, but we have also have a minus sign. So technically minus one times the minus sign is one, right? So we actually have just one plus one upon i. Now, for those of you who are a little bit confused, take a look at, take a think about it like this way, right? Minus i is actually what? Minus i is i cube, and then we're multiplying it with i. So if we add the exponents, what do we have? i to the power four, which is equal to one. So that's exactly what I did here, right? So i times i is minus one, and then we have another minus sign. So it's a negative of minus one, which is one, right? I'm just giving you multiple ways to think about it because at first it can be a little confusing and it's fine, but you know, if you just practice again and again, you will get used to it. Okay, so moving on. So we have 1 plus 1, which is 2, and i, 2 by i, whole squared. And now if you just evaluate it normally, you have 4 by i squared. And we know i squared is equal to minus 1. So 4 by minus 1, which is just 4 divided by minus 1, which is just minus 4. So then we have, uh, basically we have, minus four that's our answer all right so i hope this is clear right you know now i hope you understand how we use powers of i and we simplify them and then we you know we perform normal algebra right now the, again the key in this question was not so you know to, to perform the algebra but is understand how to use the different powers of i and like i said before the key in you know making this question as simple as possible is try to get i powers of four because then we have one you know i to the power of four is one and then we can perform any any sort of algebra and you know it's it's much more simpler to work with right it's easy on the eye and it's you know the chances of making a mistake you know decreases exponentially right now now let's look at a different case right now let's now we just dealt with 
pure imaginary numbers. Now let's look at a case where we have a combination of a real and imaginary numbers, right? So if we have pure and, sorry, not pure, what am I saying? No, not pure, real and imaginary numbers, right? We were looking at purely imaginary numbers. Now we're looking at a mix of real and imaginary numbers. So real and imaginary numbers, right? And this is what we're going to be dealing with most often in, you know, in IB questions. So let's look at an example, right? We have an equation, quadratic equation, x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to 0. And we're supposed to find the roots of the equation, right? Now, there are multiple methods, right? We can, we can plot a graph. We can use the quadratic equation. We can try factorization, you know, completing the square and all that. But, you know, in this case, I don't, we're going to have to graph it. Either we graph it and, you know, I don't really want, I don't have a graphing calculator with me right now. And I don't think I can graph it accurately, nor can I see any probable factors. So I'm just going to go ahead and use the quadratic equation, right? So if I go ahead and use the quadratic equation, you know, what's the formula? X is equal to negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So again, if you're one of those people who still has, has having difficulty you know, memorizing this, try to think, I don't you can maybe Google on YouTube or something, um, pop goes the weasel of quadratic formula, and it gives you a really nice way to memorize it. That's what happened. That's how I learned it in eighth grade, and that's how my teacher taught me. And for since then, it's still been stuck in my head. All right, so let's get back to this. Now, we have A is 1, B is 1, and C is 1 quite easy numbers to work with, right? So let's simplify this. So we have minus one plus or minus the square root. Uh, let me rewrite the square root in a better way. So we have one squared minus four times one times one. And we have all over two times one, right? Which is two. So we're left with x is equal to negative one plus or minus, right? This is one minus four, which is minus three right? And then we have all upon two, right? Now, I can rewrite this as two roots now, right? One here and one here, right? So I can start this as x1 as the first root, so which is equal to minus one plus or minus root. Sorry, I'll just write it as plus because I'm separating them. I'll write it as three. Sorry, minus three, my bad. And we have minus 3 upon 2, and x2 is equal to minus 1 minus square root of minus 3 by 2. Okay, right? We have these two equations. Now, again, we have a minus square root of something, right? We don't want to keep it that way. So let's try to convert, convert it into what we previously learned of having iota, right? We want the i there. So what we can do is we can separate this. We can write this as square root of 3 times square root of minus 1, right? So I can break this down as basically square root of 3 times square root of minus 1. And I can write square root of minus 1 as iota. So I'm left with square root of 3. So I can rewrite this as minus 1 plus root 3. And wait, let me put the iota in front just so it's a little bit, it doesn't you know look like it's in the square root. So right, iota root 3 by 2. And this is x x uh, second root which will be minus one minus iota root three by two right quite simple nothing too crazy i just i just rewrote minus square root of negative one in as the form of iota because it's a lot simpler and it's a lot easy on the eye right now this is a mixture of real and imaginary numbers right we have a, now if i have to you know simplify it a bit more how can i write this as I can write as one half plus iota root three by two. And then we have x squared, x two is equal to minus one half minus i root three by two. Now I hope you can see it, right? Let me take a highlighter. Let me, uh, let me put this in a different color, right? So if I take, um, Right, so you can see that this part is like the real part, right? Because it doesn't have iota with it, and this part, for example, 
is the imaginary part, right? So this is the combination of real and imaginary numbers. And we usually write this as Z or Z, right? This is denoted as Z. So let's change the color again. Let's make it pink. So we have general form, if I have to write it as the general form is basically Z, right? And Z is equal to X plus iota Y or IY, right? Where X is the real part and Y is the imaginary part, right? So in this case, minus half is the real part and root three by two is the imaginary part. In this case, minus half is equal to the real part. And here, the imaginary part is equal to minus root three by two. Because notice the general form consists of a plus sign. So we can actually break, if, if you have to talk about this, this would actually be minus half plus iota minus root three by two, right? Something like that. So this is a general form of Z, right? Or we, no, no, we, we or Z. Right, and we denote this as like you know, the general form of a complex number. So if I write this as a, a complex number. So now, if I had to, you know, just write it in a more you know neater manner, um, what I can do is I can I'll just you know rewrite this. So let me make a new um, here separation here, and what I can do is let's change the color as well. So it's yellow. So we have a uh, general form of a complex number, right? Where we have Z is equal to X plus I, Y, right? Where, and you might also, you know, sometimes see that um, people write A plus I, B, right? That's also completely okay. Right, so it's the x where x is the real part, and y is the imaginary part. Right, I'm just rewriting it. You know, it might have been seem a little hairy here, so I'm just rewriting the same thing in a separate place. Right now, let me just uh, say, you know, show a few properties of this entire complex number. Right, if z or z, I have a habit of saying z for some reason. So if z is you know co completely real right so if z is completely real that means the imaginary part does not exist right think about it right if z is real only the x value should stay and this entire value will not exist right it'll just like it should basically be z is equal to x right that's all so for that for that to exist y must be zero right in other words y is equal to zero right that's the first part and the second part would be obviously the opposite essentially so it'd be if z is completely imaginary right then we have basically right then we have z is equal to i y right not just y, i, y. Then x must be zero. So x is equal to zero. All right, so uh, with this, we'll end today's introductory video. And in the next video, we'll look at operations of complex numbers and a little something different, which which I, which is square root of complex numbers. So, uh, you know, the small theoretical conceptual information I'm going to discuss in the next video. This was just an introductory video. I just, I mean, it's much longer than it should have been, but I really wanted to give you guys a gist of what complex numbers is about. And, you know, because this is kind of, you know, difficult to wrap your head around it, especially if you're learning this for the first time, you might have to, you know, watch this um, recording a few more times just to get, you know, a proper intuitive feeling. But I assure you, you know, it's nothing, it's, it's not complex, right? Unlike the name, complex numbers is not complex. 
right? So uh, yeah, so that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, next video, we'll look at operations, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division of complex numbers, and a few little bit more details. All right, so this was all for today's video, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.